So welcome to the webinar on improving accuracy in precision and dietary fiber analysis. Um, the, the plan I've got for this webinar is basically to look at some of the obvious issues in conventional dietary fiber analysis. There, so many of them are often ignored or discounted, um, but they can add up and create a lot of different problems. We're going to talk about um, the proofs behind that, but most of the time that I make this kind of a presentation, I, I see people in the audience uh, acknowledging and, you know, elbowing each other and chuckling about issues that they recognize that they're doing that they haven't done anything about. It, it becomes this kind of an idea of being an unconscious incompetence. It's, in other words, you're doing something wrong and you don't even realize it. Or in some cases, uh, you realize things are not being done exactly according to the plan or to the method, but the numbers are okay, so we just, we just plug ahead because it's, in the case of dietary fiber, it's such a difficult analysis to do. I want to look at specifically the, the various uh, impacts that there are on minor variables and how they, they add up and can create a, a large uh, discrepancy in accuracy. Then during this uh, process, I'm hoping we hit on some potential fixes. Certainly, automation is where I'm going. Uh, that's what our instrumentation is. But I also want to look at some of the things that can be done within the conventional method to improve that. And quite frankly, it just means more vigilance in many cases. But I'd like to be able to discuss that. So I'll present it, but then uh, during our uh, open mic time, so to speak, we can we can get more specific and, and talk about and maybe share some ideas on that. And then lastly, as it says, I want to talk about automation and, and basically show you the, the differences that can be achieved because of automation. So when I think of dietary fiber analysis, I think of the game that many of you may be familiar with, Jenga, in which the players uh, work to take blocks out and, uh, and restack them, if you will, without the, the, the Jenga blocks uh, tipping over. In other words, trying to maintain some kind of a foundation. And, and that's a pretty good illustration of the variables that take place in any analytical method, but again, for this discussion, specifically to dietary fiber analysis. So dietary fiber analysis is prone to problems. There are over 35 steps that involve human control or human intervention. Uh, this slide just talks about just the glassware preparation, the things that are required just for preparing the glassware. And sometimes when I'm talking to laboratories, they forget that they are having to do all these steps, all the soaks and the rinses and the vacuuming and the adding the sea light and the drying, etc. Uh, but all those are required elements that require human intervention and if done uh, uh, not according to the method or people take shortcuts, that's going to potentially affect results. The other thing is related to sample preparation. The method itself calls for specific sample preparation. I believe in 985.29 section E, that's what is often referred to for sample preparation, and it talks about the grind size being 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 millimeter um, grind size or, or screen size, and yet um, uh, people don't necessarily follow that. And many commercial labs tell me, well, we get the samples already prepared. We don't know how they ground them. So that can have an impact. A larger grind size can uh, affect the penetration of the enzymes, for instance. There's also the discussion about defatting and desugaring. The method itself, and I believe I'm going to show this in a future slide, the method itself talks about defatting if you are unable to mill properly. But that has been translated by most labs as anything greater than 10%, you must defat. Um, but how it's agitated, the, the, the multiple enzyme additions, the time requirements for each, the temperature controls, the agitation requirements, all of these things are, are uh, aspects that have to be controlled by the technician. And again, more variables. The education is a factor. Um, and by the way, it's not to say the people that have the greater education are doing a better job. That's not necessarily the case. In some cases, people that have the higher education try to overthink things and try to make modifications because they're sure there's a better way. Um, and so informal and formal education can have an impact on the results. There are many people that have had, if you will, informal training. In other words, the technician that normally did the method um, basically becomes the expert in the method. And over the years, they have made modifications to simplify it for themselves 
and in some cases they've gone outside the parameters of the method, yet as they have taught everybody, they're teaching everybody that this is the method. So there's often deviations from the method that are not documented or just become, you know, this is what I was told to do, I'm running the method, when in essence they're not. Workflow demands, how much, pe how much uh, activity people are expected to get done in a given day can affect their treatment of different methods and shortcuts they'll make. The multitasking requirements, gee, I'm supposed to be back here in 10 minutes, but I'm too busy in this other project, and so I, I'm not going to be able to get back for 20 minutes. All of those things can impact uh, results, and those are human factors that in many cases are out of our control. A supervisor, I had a supervisor once tell me that he knew his technicians weren't doing a certain element of a dietary fiber. In, in particular, it was related to agitation. And he said, but I just don't have time to watch and see what everybody's doing, and I know they're not doing it. So those are all things that can impact the uh, results, obviously the accuracy and precision. John DeVries uh, wrote in the book with uh, he and Prosky co-authored on the historical perspective of defining dietary fiber, made the comment that the dietary fiber analysis requires precise handling of the digestion steps of the method. That's referring to the temperatures and the pHs and such for the different enzyme additions, the uh, amylase, the protease, and the AMG. And yet, that's an area where there is not necessarily precise handling when they're doing the conventional or manual methodology for dietary fiber. This was a, uh, a study that I found on a particular sample, agave, and the authors of this paper ultimately said that three factors, the temperature, the agitation speed, and the sample to water ratio had an impact uh, on the agave sample. Now this is certainly sample dependent. We don't find that all those three variables affect every sample, but they did a study in which they found out, wow, controlling all these factors is critical for that sample. Well, uh, it is sample dependent and uh, you know, maybe another sample is more sensitive to temperature, or another one more sensitive to agitation. All these things can have an impact on results, and if you're not aware of it and you're not following the standard, the method, then uh, it can create a problem because, again, how someone handles a sample is going to affect their results. So, so one person, you know, is precisely controlling temperature and agitation. Another person, you know, just has a water bath that they check every once in a while. So those two labs are going to get two different results because of the impact of lack of control of variables. Ultimately, the goal is to follow the standard, the method as it is written. Let's talk a little bit about sample preparation. This is what I was referring to a little while ago about how the, the mesh size is listed in the method, how the sample is to be milled, all that is listed in the method. And you can talk to different labs. I've been at labs that every sample, regardless of what it is, because in many cases they don't know what the sample is, it's given to them blind, they, they defat and desugar every sample in a 50-50 mix of petroleum ether and methanol, if I recall correctly. Every sample. Well, if those same samples are going to another lab and they don't do the defatting, they don't do the, the desugaring, so to speak, uh, will their number be different? Um, so those are the kind of things that affect results. I like to use this example. Hopefully I can make this work. This is a parameterization of something I actually saw in a laboratory. It wasn't related to dietary fiber, but it was a sample handling issue. And so here was a person that had a series of Wattman's papers uh, in, a, in a desk before them, and they were all weighed, and then they were, she was weighing out the samples, placing them in the Wattman paper, and she was you know, being very careful about her weighing and things like that, and she would stack these samples in front of her. Then after she got all her weights and everything all set, so she's got a series of, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 twelve sets of, of samples there, she would then take each one, and she'd ha she had them numbered, she would take each one and she would encapsulate the sample by wrapping it in the Wattman paper, and then uh, she would place it in the cellulose thimbles that she had in the beakers. So here's, you know, sample one, she's 
doing or folding to kind of create a, uh, if you will, a filter bag. <laughs> That's what Ancom's known for. Um, so she'd set that up and she'd place it in. So she did the first two samples without incident. So let's just watch this as she's doing it. I don't have the capability of uh, fast forwarding it right now. And by the way, I'm standing behind her. I don't know if she knows I'm behind her at this point or not, but I'm standing behind and watching this technician do her job just because I was curious as to what she was doing. So she took her second one, stuck it in the thimble, and she reached for her third one. Notice how she's wiping up her hands each time. So if she got sample on her hand, she's just kind of you know, dispersing it. But when she did this one, that's exactly what she did. She, she spilled it, and she looked every which way to make sure no one was seeing her. And then, and she, by the way, she didn't have gloves on her hand. She took her hand, she um, scraped it into the sample, and then she blew. Now, the person that I was watching, when she blew it, um, all the other Wattman papers kind of fluttered. And so she might have ex had an impact on those, but she wasn't paying attention to that. I stepped forward at this point, and I said, so what are you going to do with that sample? And she looked me straight in the eye and said, close enough. And so those are the kind of things that, that can drive people crazy because um, if she's you know, responsible for this and she's not being supervised and she thinks that's close enough, well, it might not be close enough and it's going to have an effect on her numbers. Certainly, they are going to have some controls built in so they might be able to check that. But if they're just basing it on controls, separate from that, uh, you know, standard deviations or such on the, on the sample that they're running, um, the control could be right, uh, but that sample could be wrong, but who's going to know? So that's one element of it. Now there's this idea of the agitation and uh, the sample disbursement, or maybe I should say the surface area that's given to the enzymes by how the sample is treated during the enzyme digestions. In AOAC 991.43, it talks about stirring on a magnetic stirrer until the sample is completely dispersed. And they talk about they don't want to have lump formations in there. They want the, the this material, the sample, to be accessible to the enzyme. So they want a nice stirring on, on that. 98529 says that in the case of their initial treatment, the amylase, they want them to shake it gently at five-minute intervals. So whereas the 99143 it has a continuous stirring and by the way in 99143 it talks about continuous stirring for the protease and the AMG 985 starts with gently shaking at 5 minute intervals for the amylase and then follows that with continuous agitation during the protease and the AMG and so those are what the methods require however what we find is the method of agitation that is being used in most laboratories is going to be anything from a shaker bath to a magnetic stir bar to this idea of manually, you know, every once in a while give it a stir, every once in a while um, rotate or shake the, the beaker that is in the, the, the water baths. All those things are going to have an impact on the agitation. I was uh, had one customer that I was at our lab and he was watching our system do its agitation, the automated system do the agitation, and he made the statement to me, he says, that's enough for me to purchase the system right now. And when I questioned him on that, because it was kind of a strange statement to make, he basically told me that they didn't have enough water baths and they didn't have shaker baths for that, and so their volume was so high that they really couldn't, you know, make it so they could have all shaker baths and things like that, cost and space and et cetera. And so he said, we tell our technicians to swirl the beakers every 10 minutes. But then he made this comment, but I don't think they do it, nor can I watch to make sure they're doing it. So he was questioning if the method was being followed because he understood that agitation was necessary in order to give enough surface area for the enzymes to do their work. Likewise, there's the speed of agitation. Um, and I'm going to show you some uh, movies of some uh, videos that I took of different types of agitation that I've seen out there and how that can affect us. So the speed of ag agitation could be uh, too much or not enough uh, in order to do the job that it's called to do, the idea of surface area for the enzymes. And that's the purpose of the agitation. The purpose of the agitation is to make sure the sample is given, um, or the enzymes, I should say, are given full access to the sample in order to do the proper digestion. If the sample is sitting there in a clump or a lump, 
uh, if the if the sample size is too big, in other words, the grind size is too big, all those are things that can affect the ability for the enzyme to do the work it's called to do. So if the sample is properly prepared and the agitation is sufficient to allow the surface area for the enzyme to do its work, you can get a good digestion. Uh, but that's the key purpose of the agitation. So let's look at a, a couple examples. This one is stir bar and on this one um, you can see that it it stirs it quite well. I mean it's really good um, surface area and such. But as you can see as I sped up the, the speed look what's happening on the sides of the beaker. Uh, if you go too fast you're actually throwing sample out to the sides of the beaker and unless that's constantly rinsed down you're going to basically have a, a la less than full digestion of the sample that is out of the solution uh, during the process. If you look at an orbital shaker, you see, there you go, orbital shaker, look at that. Um, by the way, this is, I actually did this with enzyme, with buffer to match the method and look at the sample. It's just sitting there and I actually over time kept speeding up the agitation to the, the highest um, orbital shaker capability of this one. This was a polyscience orbital shaker, I believe. Um, you don't see that sample getting dispersed. You don't see good surface area for the enzymes to do their work on that one. However, when I went to Barry McCleary's lab, let's see if I can find it here. Barry McCleary's lab, where he uses a fairly aggressive shaker in jars, um, that sample was sloshing all over the place. I'll play that again. Um, that sample was sloshing all over the place, and it appeared to be, because it was sloshing both ways, that it was con consistently rinsing sample off the sides of it. So that seemed to be a fairly good uh, agitation vehicle that he was using in his laboratory. Um, so stir bar, the stir bar and this form of, uh, I believe it's more of a linear shaker, but the, the aggressive agitation, all those ones were secured in the shaker bath so that they could go at a fairly rapid speed. Um, that appeared to give good surface area for the samples. But I would say, probably, I think comfortably I could say that 8 out of 10 laboratories that I have visited have used shaker water baths. The other 20%, um, if you will, were, were using nothing. In other words, they were just sitting it in a water bath and manually shaking it or sometimes not shaking it at all. That's contrary to the method. When it comes to temperature control, this is directly out of 991.43. It talks about the incubation of the amylase at 95 to 100 degrees for at least 15 minutes with continuous agitation. Um, and then it makes that statement that it's normally 35 minutes is sufficient to do this with a, a normal water bath is kind of how it's saying it. Yet I have been in laboratories where they said no, it is supposed to be 95 to 100 degrees for 35 minutes. And in this example I'm giving, it's because there was a mistranslation from English to another language uh, of what the method stated. So here's one lab that's doing uh, amylase digestion 95 to 100 degrees for 35 minutes, whereas the method talks about at least 15 minutes at that temperature. So again, different results, sample dependent, different results from different labs because of how they're handling it. Likewise, if you look at the, the temperature control requirements, it's written a little bit differently in the different methods. 99143 talks about the 35 minutes being normally sufficient, 98529, if you will, the original method talks about 30 minutes would be normally sufficient. Same temperature requirements, but again, it's just this. It, the reason I bring this up, it, the point is this. It's not the 35 minutes or the 30 minutes that's the point. The point is that in different water baths, different setups, uh, the amount of time needed to get the 15 minutes at 95 to 100 degrees is going to vary. Ambient temperature of the lab that's involved, all those kind of things are going to affect the heat up time. The key is at least 15 minutes at 95 to 100 degrees. I like to, to look at this because this is uh, a critical element of the dietary fiber method for the conventional method. And that is the use of a fruited glass crucible. Uh, it is a 40 to 60 micron uh, crucible that, depending on the method, requires the addition of, or the vacuuming in, if you will, of diatomaceous earth or sea light for a brand name, 
uh, into the glass in order to create the proper filtration so they don't have particle loss. Uh, likewise, there is only, only a certain amount of surface area on a fritted glass crucible. The method calls for 60 millimeter uh, uh, gooch crucible, uh, fritted glass crucible. And so there's only that size of about a, a half a dollar, if you will, that's, uh, that is the filtering surface. If you were to look at the specific glass itself under magnification, you would see without the sea light, there is a considerable uh, number of openings, if you will, that, that porosity, that 40 to 60 micron porosity that the method actually calls out. Those voids in there are potential places for the loss of particles that you want to capture. But that's why they add the diatomaceous earth. That changes the porosity to really under 8 microns, but um, the bottom line is that's the filtration. The crucible, in essence, becomes the holder for the filtration. So there is an important element that the need in the conventional method in order to get the lower porosity for the method, how they do, how they vacuum in that, that diatomaceous earth is a critical element to provide the proper filtration. What happens when they're doing the filtration with under this setup is, again, you're looking at, at a total dietary fiber, you're looking at someplace around 300 milliliters of filtrate that you have to filter through a 60 milliliter gooch crucible with diatomaceous earth as a bed and, and a vacuum flask. And at times, again, sample dependent, a gel forms above the diatomaceous earth and basically stops the filtration. The method then says that you are supposed to scratch the surface of the gel in order to break that, um, that block. So then the sample or the filtrate again can fill that void, filtration can continue. And so the technicians have to continually go back in order to um, scratch the surface of the gel in order to uh, continue filtration. The problem is that if you watch most labs over time, they start digging deeper and deeper and deeper. Why? Because it's taking too long to filter. They want to hurry it up. And so by scratching into the diatomaceous earth, they basically um, change the porosity. Yes, there is diatomaceous earth vacuumed into those voids, but they're basically giving their more area uh, without a block, if you will, without filtration for the sample to get through. And I've seen people actually take it right to the glass um, in order to get the filtering going faster. Quite frankly, how they set up the vacuum is going to be uh, a critical element. Let's talk about one thing also related. There are some instruments in which the way they handle or speed up filtration is they reverse. They go from a vacuum to a positive pressure in order to blow uh, air up through the diatomaceous earth, the, the fritted glass crucible, the diatomaceous earth, and if, if you will, um, open up all the things that you've, you've clogged, if you will, by vacuuming in the diatomaceous earth so the filtration can go faster. The problem is they've just defeated the purpose of the diatomaceous earth. They've eliminated or removed the filtration uh, element of that process. So, yeah, it might have sped up the, the filter, filtering, but there's probably, well, there's almost definitely particle loss that's going to take place as a result, and that's going to affect your, your precision and, of course, your accuracy. So what does this all mean? It, it, it means that, one, the impact is going to vary by sample type. Some samples are more uh, affected by variations in, in the variables, if I could say it that way. Uh, some, you know, they, they are pretty, um, pretty consistent. You know, the temperature can change by 5, 6, 10 degrees maybe. Doesn't really affect. The agitation, well, that, that can have a little effect, but nothing really critical. Um, you know, all these different elements that we talked about can have minor, minor impacts on some sample types. But as I demonstrated with that one paper about the agave, they had three variables that had major impact on their results. So it is going to vary by sample type, but the, the bottom line is that each variable, each, if you will, piece of the Jenga that they take out, every time they do that, that, that causes the foundation to be a little shaky, and the ultimate um, result can be that the whole thing collapses. In other words, the results are 
not even near what they really are. The impact is cumulative. One variable might be a little bit, another variable just a little bit. And if you keep adding those little bits, it all of a sudden becomes a significant impact. So unless things are done within the laboratory to, to make changes, to um, fix those problems where variables are changed, whether it's because you know people decide, gee, I'm going to pick a shortcut, or whether it is because they don't understand the method, uh, unless there's foundational changes, you're not going to get good accuracy and precision, and, it, and it's something we have to think about. So if I'm still talking about the conventional method, um, what are some of the things that I would pick out of this? One thing is check samples are not enough. It really takes a regular review with the personnel that are doing the method uh, to look at what the methodology requires and talk about why it requires it. Why do we do certain things that we do? Uh, and I think when people understand why a method calls for certain actions, be it temperature, be it agitation, if people understand that and recognize that, hey, your modification of this could have a significant impact on the results, which could equate to you having to redo a sample, uh, it's going to start sinking in. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the official methodology. And by, by the way, that's for everybody, because uh, in so many cases, and, it, and I see this pretty commonly, we run into situations where someone has been teaching people how to do it, and everybody is told that that's the official method. So without ever seeing the method, they're relying on that technician that's been doing it for 10, 15 years uh, to train them. And boy, his training might be great. The problem is he's training them how to not follow the method. That's, that's important. Likewise, with that uh, idea of regular review, this idea of, of periodically monitoring those practices. Uh, are the people actually doing it? And quite frankly, I would suggest that if you find people are so busy that they're cutting corners on those methods, then it might be worth looking at the workflow to say, okay, what do we have to do different because people are taking shortcuts. Why? Because their workload is such that they can't, they can't um, honor the method um, under the constraints that we have. So that's something to be watched as well. This idea of regular proficiency training and testing, I think that's something that we all should be looking at in many different things that we do. Uh, you know, are people maintaining their proficiency uh, or are we getting lazy? Because it happens and, and it can happen to the greatest technicians as well as those ones that are, are, for lack of a better term, that are slackers. We have to be careful and the way to do it is to provide them the training and the testing so they can really see where they are on this. Lastly, and this kind of goes to the ANCOM methodology, the automation that we've provided, is look for ways to automate the repetitive task. You know, our system, and I'll go a little bit more in depth in this, but our system allows you to basically put the sample in and walk away. The system controls the enzyme additions, the temperature requirements, the agitation, the temperature control, I believe I already said, so everything is controlled on that. Then the filtration is handled with our system where there is no issue about clogging because we have increased the surface area of the filtration. And I'm going to talk more specifically about that. But this, this is just, if we will, quick overview of the issues around the conventional method. Now let's talk a little bit about automation in particular and the ANCOM system um, specifically. So this is the dietary fiber system as you would see it on a shelf. It's got two sections, an upper and a lower section. The upper section is where the, the IDF or enzyme digestions take place. Um, what you can note here is, and we've just got them pictured here, there are what we call dual chamber filter bags on top and bottom. In this case, this is uh, showing no filter, so no dual chamber in this sense. This is the bag that would be used for doing a total dietary fiber analysis. In other words, we would not be separating the insoluble dietary fiber, or, or IDF, from the precipitation phase at the bottom. The enzyme digestions would all take place controlled in this section. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then after that um, three enzymatic digestions take place, then all of that um, solution and sample would drop down into a preheated, pre-filled 95% ethanol number for um, precipitation. 
then there is a filter on the bottom that would be the final part to in order to capture both the insoluble and soluble dietary fiber and give you a TDF result. The bottom portion is that where there's the SDF or the precipitation chamber. You will always use a SDF bag on the bottom. Uh, what you use in the top is dependent on the analysis that you want to do. Uh, and I alluded to it, but this gives you an idea of what we're talking about. We have three different dual chamber filter bags that are involved. There is the flow through bag, which as I said before, is really not a dual chamber because it just does not have a filter. Um, but the, the bag itself acts as a beaker. There's an insoluble dietary fiber filter bag. That is one that acts as a beaker on the top and filtration on the bottom. Our system will provide the separation between the upper portion and the lower portion. And then for all analysis, you're going to be using the what we call the SDF filter bag. And here you can actually see it. This top portion is a, is a uh, poly material. Uh, there is a mechanical separation by the instrument that separates this upper portion from the lower filter portion. So that's, that's the basic concept that it works. Uh, in order to automate. We eliminate that transfer issue because the system is able to do it via these dual chamber filter bags. If you think about the method itself, and I'm going to be spending some time uh, showing you some videos that are going to kind of capsulize or um, capture this information uh, again, so you're going to see it again, but I'd like to walk through it a little bit just so you can get a good understanding. Using 99143 as the, the starting point for this um, demonstration. This is the conventional method. As you can see, there is a number of steps that have to take place just to prepare the fritted glass crucibles. Then there's the digestion of the sample, there's the filtration of the, if you're capturing IDF and SDF, uh, there's the isolation of that, there's the rinse processes and things like that. But what you see is there are 35 steps according to the method that have to be taken uh, care of to run the method. Uh, again, remember a bunch of that includes the preparation of the glassware. Well, with the automated method, we have eliminated the glassware, so we don't have to do any of these steps right here. All we have to do is weigh filter bags, weigh, weigh samples, diatomaceous earth, install the filter bags, and then place both sample and diatomaceous earth in their appropriate locations. When it comes to the, the enzymatic digestions, the three different enzymes, the two different temperature controls, the pH change and things like that, the computer, the system, automatically handles all of those items. The only thing the technician has to do is come back at the appropriate time, and the instrument will alert them, in order to check and adjust the pH. The system will add the required, in this case, amount of hydrochloric acid, do some mixing and then it will alert you to check the pH. Uh, you'll check the pH, adjust it accordingly, and then basically um, walk away. Now this is an error. I, I just noticed this. This digest at 60 degrees should not be there. Uh, that is not part of the process. Uh, the system does that as well. So amylase at the 95 to 100 degrees for at least 15 minutes, protease for the 30 minutes, AMG for 30 minutes with that pH uh, adjustment in between. And I apologize, that didn't get blocked out there. When it comes to the insoluble dietary fiber and capturing that, the system will handle all of that. It'll transfer it from the digestion phase to the uh, filtering phase automatically, including all the rinses and things that have to be done. So what you have in this case is all that is eliminated. Same thing goes when you do the, the after the precipitation um, and the filtration. The instrument takes care of all of those steps. All you have to do, as you do with the insoluble dietary fiber fraction, is do a manual rinse with acetone. And I'm, uh, I'm going to show you a video now that just puts a lot of this all together, but it's a video that I did a while ago as just an introduction to the system. Some of this information is going to be repeated, but most of all, I want you to see the basics of the system without having to spend a lot of time watching it. So let's watch this video to give you a good understanding of how the system works. Hi, my name is Chris Kelly, and today's video will highlight the ANCOM TDF Dietary Fiber Analyzer. Dietary fiber analysis is probably the most labor-intensive assay performed. There are over 40 manual steps required to perform a total dietary fiber analysis. With the ANCOM automated system, technician labor is reduced by no less than 50%, with about 12 manual steps. By automating repetitive acts, the ANCOM Dietary Fiber Analyzer improves accuracy and precision. 
Additionally, increased surface area of the filtering system eliminates clogged filters and reduces filtration time by as much as 90% over printed glass crucibles. Already in use in large and small labs in over 30 countries, the ANCOM dietary fiber system is freeing up technicians to complete all the other work on their busy schedules. With improved inter- and intra-lab accuracy and precision, redos are virtually eliminated. Here's how the system works. Dual chamber filter bags, samples, and diatomaceous earth are weighed. The user selects the method they will run, and the controller walks the technician through each step from installing the filter bags, inserting the diatomaceous earth and sample, and confirming the solution setup. Once the start button is pressed, the technician can walk away. The instrument does all the work. Enzymes and solutions are added according to the method. Heat and agitation is controlled. Every aspect of the chosen method is managed without technician intervention. It really is that simple. When the process is complete, the samples are removed, rinsed with acetone as per the method, dried, and reweighed. Ash and protein corrections are determined as with the conventional method, and results are calculated. The system is configured to support AOAC 985.29, 991.43, and 2001.03. An upgrade is available that will add AOAC 2009.01 and 2011.25. If you have any questions or would like more details, you can contact us using the details provided right here. So that gives you a good overview of how the system works and the basic operation of it. I'd like to close our time together talking first about the agitation and then a comparison of filtration. And I think I can show you just a couple of videos that will help understand that. But just as a setup, um, I talked about earlier that the purpose of the agitation is to give enough surface area for the enzymes to work on the sample. So if there's not um, adequate mixing, then it is going to affect the ability of the enzymes to do their job. And so our agitation is designed to make sure there's a constant and consistent movement of the sample within the uh, dual chamber filter bag in order to make the enzyme access um, as good as possible. So let's take a look at this video that shows you how that works, and I'll talk a little bit about that as we do it. It's about a minute long video. Okay, so this shows the system in operation with the agitation and heat uh, at the sample level. And there's a separation you can see here that separates the upper from the lower. This is actually an oat brand sample in these first two. And um, as you can see at, from a distance, there is a constant movement of the sample within. In a second, we'll zoom in, and now you can see how what we call a double vortex, and in many ways it's really uh, a, a four-place uh, vortex, uh, but the sample is constantly being spun around within the heated solution. And we believe that's a superior agitation because we're constantly moving the sample within the buffer and, in this case, the uh, amylase portion, and that makes for a much better agitation process and that's superior to any of the agitations that I showed you earlier. Now let's move to the comparison of filtration. Remember I talked about how the Gooch Crucible as compared to the filter bag technology, um, the Gooch Crucible has far less surface area for the filtration to take place and that's why they are constantly clogging in, in conventional methods. Here we're and obviously the thing speeded up to make it go faster, but here we're showing uh, samples of oat bran and pectin side by side. And in our system, the oat bran, the filtration portion was done in 2 minutes and 15 seconds and the pectin in 4 minutes and 21 seconds. While as you can see in the bottom portion there, uh, we have to slowly pour in the uh, filtrate into the flask and vacuums and there's a much larger amount of liquid going into a 60 milliliter gooch crucible so that takes a lot of time so on the conventional excuse me on the automated method eight minutes and 28 seconds for rinsing filtering and rinsing for of the oat bran and 10 minutes and 42 seconds for the filtration and rinsing for the pectin but when you go to the conventional method the filtration took 15 minutes a little bit more than 15 minutes just for the filtration portion um, and the 
final process, the rinses and everything that are required by the method, took 25 minutes. The pectin, of course, was much longer because it, it forms a gel, consistently forms a gel, and that, has to be, that gel has to be broken as per the method in order to continue the filtration. And again, you're constantly pouring uh, liquid in because you've got such a larger amount of solution to uh, pour in. So an hour and 40 minutes just for the filtration portion. Then there are a series of four rinses, just like with the oat brand, uh, 278% ethanol to 95% ethanol. And that brought the time to an, an hour and 49 minutes to filter that. So from a standpoint of which one's faster, clearly the automated method with four, three to four times more surface area eliminates the problems that are associated with clogged filters. So that's a broad overview of the automated system that we offer. It is the only system in the world that actually automates the entire method or the entire analysis. You still do have to do the ash and protein corrections as per the method. Overall or in summary, uh, automation eliminates the majority of the technician variability. Uh, inter and intralab precision is going to be improved and I think that's kind of a critical area because uh, we look at check sample programs and uh, you know with we have one with 24 different laboratories involved and the variation of results reported can be huge in some cases uh, five to eight point differences between laboratories automation uh, reduces and, and quite frankly solves that issue the system's going to control everything, the temperature, the agitation, everything according to the method requirements. Uh, and of course, increased filtration surface area decreases the filtration time and eliminates this idea of a technician having to come back to break the surface of the gel. Lots of times people will say to us, well, is your method faster? And I always have to remind them that our system runs the method. And so all the times are according to the method. All the additions are according to the method. We can't change the chemistry to run the method. Where we save time is the filtration. And so you can see some significant uh, reductions in time just because of filtration. Ultimately, you save time and money. You, if you are reducing the labor that's needed, you're saving on your cost and at the same time increasing your accuracy and precision. So that's, that's it for the, the webinar. Uh, I, we want to address questions. Uh, thank you for some of the ones you've already submitted. And so let's spend some time for the ending portion of this webinar addressing some of the questions that you have uh, sent us.